Bites podcast, where the realms of food, technology, and cybersecurity converge in fascinating ways. Today, we're navigating the critical intersection of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and the food industry. I'm your host, Kristen Amaranville. And today we're joined by special guest, Dr. Ryan Hartfield, a pioneer in the field of AI and cybersecurity. Today, we'll unravel the innovations and challenges at this unique crossroads. So let's get started. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, especially since we have an ocean in between us and time zones are fun. Well, thank you very much for the, the invite. I'm really glad to be on the podcast. Great. Let's go with introductions first and then we'll start the fun stuff up. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background, uh, where I've been and what I've done. So Ryan Hartfield, I've been in the cybersecurity industry across quite a few sectors now for around 14, 15 years. Started off actually working for the Olympics, actually. Uh, in the Olympics? London. Yeah, yeah. London Olympics. It was called Low Cog at the time. So London 2012. I mean, that was the first real job I had actually, uh, apart from working academia, just all of that. And um, moved from there to work for government for around eight years, uh, national security in particular. So done a, a whole bunch of interesting weird and wonderful things there, focusing on network security, security architecture, and then moved into into working in a public sector or private sector rather, working for Splunk. For those that aren't aware of Splunk, uh, they're, they call themselves the data to everything platform, but they, they focus heavily on cybersecurity and using machine data for cybersecurity. So there I led uh, in EMEA, the, the security architecture for what we refer to as security orchestration automation and response. Really a fancy term for automating instant response programmatically in instant response cybersecurity. And then after Splunk, I co-founded a startup, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit today uh, in the context of um, food security. But I had a, weird, a bit of a weird side life, I guess, in parallel to this kind of career, which is I worked in academia as well. Kind of mixture of full and part-time if you can say that I did in the full-time hours, but I was technically part-time in, 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 in role. So I worked at University of Greenwich and across other universities as a research fellow focusing on AI, uh, but practically in its use in, in cybersecurity and cyber detection and response for cyber physical systems, which is a really, it was originally a kind of scientific term we used academia, but it's finding itself now in the marketing space with, uh, with you know, OT security. Uh, so focus heavily on how we use AI to, to help support cyber physical systems detection and response for threats and, and issues. So that's my life in a nutshell, really. Uh, but I've been over a f- quite a few different uh, industries from IT to, to OT and all the mixture in between. That's fantastic. I love that you started with the Olympics. That's it's really uh, fun. It's good fun. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. Like, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I knew the people who toured with like you two and the Rolling Stones for a bit, but they were doing their tech support and their Wi-Fi setup for the actual band. Oh, really? Um, so they're roadies. That's like the only other like really cool thing I've ever heard anybody ever really do like that. So that's awesome. No, it's um, really cool. It was really and you get to I mean, probably go to the Olympics too. I mean, you were there. So yeah, it was it was also, I mean, the, the thing about it was it's actually quite a technological masterpiece really because if you imagine and I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point later in the podcast it's a mixture of lots of IoT systems and flat pack buildings and communications mechanical electrical systems you know running the entire show really so I mean I wasn't involved in the kind of building and fabrication of the event I was involved in more of the support side as my first job on the engineering side but it was really a fantastic environment to be in the atmosphere there's a working environment super fun to be in and see the events and stuff like that so really good start I guess to be (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Maybe downhill from then. Oh, stop. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I like it because you're you're working on something like a common goal, right? Everybody knows what the outcome is. It's a really great show at the Olympics, right? Because it is a show. It's Besides the competition, it's a show. And that's probably why you really enjoyed it because everybody was working towards that same goal. Whereas, you know, cybersecurity as a whole and even food professionals would probably agree with this. It's a little bit convoluted sometimes. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to secure something. But what is that? Data? Yes. People, hopefully. And then for the food teams, it's obviously securing for safety and security of our food that we ingest. So that's again, Ryan, you've kind of nailed why this podcast exists is because we're trying to create this space where we're all realizing we're doing the same thing. And that's making sure we have healthy food is accessible for others. And that goes back down to water and to soil. So it's super important. So I love that you you've had that offhand experience. You get it. You get what we're we're trying to do here. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, thank you for that. I, I I love when I talk to guests because everybody's so accomplished and it makes me feel like really happy that like you've had 
have this really full life. That's awesome. Okay, so let's go on to the ever popular questions of favorite food and favorite food memory. They do not need to be the same thing. I think it's going to sound really, from my point of view, I don't know, cliche, but I just really, I love pizza. <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's it's not so much like, of course I go to restaurants, etc., and I have really fantastic meals, you know, my wife and my kids, what have you, that I've been built beautifully. But sometimes I'm just sitting there in the evening and you're hungry, you're like, smash a pizza right now. And for me, pepperoni pizza just hits the job. It's not good for you. I know it afterwards. I feel guilty. I hate myself. That the moment fun. between getting it and eating it is just like me. Favorite food is pizza because just of the of the situations in which I usually consume it. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I, I, it's funny because you're the second guest who said that actually so far. Oh, really? And yeah. And he was mentioning that when he was on a diet, he used to make his gluten free. So you can't oh, really? have healthy pizza. I mean, you could do that like cauliflower crust now if you wouldn't get yeah. really wild, which is really good as long as it's super crispy. Like if it's doughy, yeah, it's not, yeah. no, it's not a vibe. But yeah, no, pizza's great. I am, I am a pineapple on pizza person. I just, I know. Don't speak yeah. to Italians. Don't speak to Italians. I, I, I know, right? I know, I know. It's a salty, sweet thing. Like get whatever, get over it. It's not your body, people. I do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but it's funny because I recently said it on another podcast that I was on, No Passport Required. And yeah. they actually, they put it up on like their social media and they're like, Chris, it has no fear in saying this. And I'm like, Jeez. oh God, <laughs> Maybe I have a little fear now. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm entering Italy now, you know. So the question though becomes, there's so many different types of pizza, like yeah. pizza style. Um, in the US, we have Midwest style, which is cut into squares. And then okay. New York style is cut into, you know, the actual the triangle pizza. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, this is again, not very much popular opinion. I prefer the squares. Because oh, you get the gosh. little like crust ends, right? Oh, no, like no. it's great. And so now everybody, now all the New Yorkers are like, that's it. We hate this girl. It's over. <laughs> and or all the Italians are also arming up. It's it's fine. Do, do you know how the most the most place I've seen that done in the in like where I'm in the UK is when you're at a party and basically someone's creating a big tray of pizza and they're trying to make sure that within in, in the Bible feeding the five thousand, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make as many pizza slices of pizza as possible, right? In this case, that's where I see it. But I've never seen it anywhere else. <laughs> in the UK, it's always well, angles. the next time you fly through Chicago, make sure you get actual a proper pie there and okay, not. We'll just a deep dish. You want to get the thin crust. Like that's not yeah. great. Okay. It's amazing. And so now your favorite food memory. Wow, this is hard. I think again, it's going to be another another cliche. And it'll probably be at Christmas time, having just Christmas dinner with my kids and There's nothing salty. cliche about that. So salty. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. So you're going to have to explain for the non-UK listeners what Christmas dinner looks like. Oh, okay. I mean, it's not much different anywhere than you would see in the US, I guess. Maybe some of the trimmings are different. So obviously, for the most part, though, it, it can be a turkey, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, you cook the turkey. I mean, we, we tend to go, OK, well, chicken sometimes because turkey's so dry. So uh, chicken, duck or, or, or turkey, that's the same. But you, we would have, you know, roast potatoes, cooked in duck fat, Yorkshire puddings. You know, I don't know if you... you They're popovers here, people, if you don't know what they are. Okay, so, Yorkshire yeah. pudding, big Yorkshire I'll, tr- I'll translate for you, Ryan. I will be your <laughs> UK to US translator. Uh, we have pigs in blankets. So that's basically, mm. mini, you know, the mini sausages is basically... Sausages, yeah. from, um, and then uh, like cauliflower cheese, which is fantastic, of course. And obviously carrots, broccoli, peas. What else is there that's unique about the about the Christmas dinner? I mean, you have, you have Swedes, right? Swede. I don't really like them. Brussels sprouts. I like Brussels sprouts now. I hate yeah. them when I was younger, right? Brussels that's sprouts. We now. didn't know how to cook them, and we were exactly. younger. Now they're better. Yeah, I love Brussels yeah. sprouts. Yeah. And then obviously, I ho- and then basically finish that off with a massive slab of gravy on top, and that's 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 practically Christmas dinner. But yeah, that's it. Just makes it it's just so with being around people that you love and having a great time and atmosphere. So that's that's my favorite. You said duck. That's not usually a thing here. And probably most Americans really didn't have goose because they're thinking of Tiny Tim. And that's, oh. you guys don't have goose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't. No, but- we don't really like Charles Dickens, you know. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's funny how many stereotypes I have to break because, I mean, it, there's no secret I'm engaged to a British man. So, like, it's quite <laughs> funny. Like, I have to translate a lot. I'm trying to think of, like, stuffing. Do you do the balls of stuffing or just, oh, like, the sorry, Yeah, I mean, you're right. I've missed, like, a quintessential British thing, right, which is you can have, it's a really odd term I've never liked, giblets, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, in the, well, it's an odd, weird old term, but that's where you put the stuff, you put the stuffing tight inside the, the, the turkey or the chicken or what have you. But usually, yeah, you have stuff like a sausage stuffing, stuffing balls. You make yourself a sausage, Serena. 
house otherwise people mm-hmm. eat other cheap ones a bit, a little bit more crossier yeah out of the packet don't yeah. the packet man we still use the packets here <laughs> it's just not, not sausage right it's some other weird ingredient I don't know what it is for those part but yeah it's definitely stuffing as well but you know go back to the duck really quickly I mean, I'll do a whole podcast about Christmas dinner but <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> the uh, the duck it, you know tends to be small right and it's really fatty so I think people just choose that when it's bed up of turkey or they have it a big enough group around them that they can have a bit of turkey and a bit of duck because it's, it's really tasty but just tiny you can't fit in or feed anyone with it um, of course if you've got a ghost in store it's like bigger but yeah that's that's how we go I love duck I love duck it's, I, it's the thing I go to when I go overseas immediately I oh, love really? it it's great yeah and actually there's a couple of restaurants here in the DC area where I live that um I do it really well and I've had okay. to start talking to the chefs at some of these restaurants to find out who does it better so I could go have that <laughs> which is probably the most like bougie thing I could ever say out loud but I do I look for a good duck but um that's amazing <laughs> yeah because you're right you get bored of chicken and turkey and and you yeah. know and Cornish hen like I don't want all that and then when I went to the UK I think for the, was it was my first trip in I think it was my first trip in ever somebody ordered pigeon and I was like pigeon. How, do, how do you eat pigeon and then they're like oh they're like oh we have wood pigeons here I'm like what's a wood pigeon and I saw one for the first time on like the the grass it, the grass area out front of that famous yes. spot of bath i saw uh, these ginormous dinosaur sized pigeons <laughs> and i lost it i had to get back in the car i couldn't be around these birds they're too big they look like a house cat like i can't even they're so big and then my in-laws have them in their backyard at the theater and they are right, right. by the door and every time they fly in i jump a mile on the couch and i'm like 50 feet away from these things i don't think i've seen these wood pigeons i don't think i've seen i mean freaking pigeons. pigeon there's nothing on them for the most part but, well um, if you eat the wood pigeons they're fat. They have like actually have a proper like breast you can put. Really. Uh, you know, uh, pigeons, little bastards. The series of chicken as well is. <laughs> The thing of chicken is like we have, we have chicken like at brunch dinners every Sunday. Oh yeah, at least it's very you know very common thing to do. So chicken gets a bit old. So but the problem with turkey is it's a bit dry and it's really well. So unless you're a good cook, you just the opportunity to muck it up is pretty high. Oh yeah, yeah. and who has time for basting? <laughs> oh I know. I mean, I'm not oh, right. do all that. Like <laughs> we usually have a um, like a lamb. You know, yes. That's what we do. The kids like lamb, so we like lamb. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Um, and it's easy. I mean, min sauce is where it's at. You know. Yeah. So. Mm. And Absolutely. then everything else you said for trimmings goes perfect with that. So yeah, precisely. Yeah, I uh, I eat way more <laughs> lamb than I ever have in my life since I'm not uh, with Americans as much, <laughs> which is it's totally fine. And uh, now I want a lamb kebab. So um, here we are. <laughs> Just don't eat the ones that come off the spit in the UK because that is like, you know, the whole carcass thrown in, right? And something else come out the other end. It's not like nice, like, nice, fresh lamb. It's been there for a, a long time. I feel like, Ryan, if you were drunk, and you wouldn't even care. You just want to eat I mean, that's no. different. It's a different <laughs> and story, right? usually when you go in those. Yeah, that's when you, you go in those. You throw chili sauce on it and you, and you, and you, and you suck out. sauce, you have like the worst breath in the world trying to kill everybody on top of the fact you're trying to get over your hangover like yeah absolutely and these are fun tips with Ryan and Krista <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness anyways let's get to the meat and potatoes of the podcast yeah, that's uh, it <laughs> so you mentioned that you did some AI driven research yeah can you can you give us a little bit more about what that was like and how you feel like that particular research could directly be applied to like the unique cybersecurity challenges within the food industry yeah of course I think I'll, I'll take you on a, a sort of mini journey back in time to 2012 slash 20. I feel like we need to have music. Yeah, yeah. That's that <laughs> Christmas carol now. Um, you know, go back in time, see the mistakes we made. Uh, no, so, you know, back in, it started in 2012, but it was really around 2014 that we started to publish the work. I was working with a number of colleagues at the University of Greenwich, collaborating on what we called psychophysical physical intrusion detection. And this was at a time where the emerging problem of where attacks could cause physical impact on a, on a machine, whether that's a robotic system or industrial system or any system that combines sort of cyber and, and physical uh, connectivity and, and um, automation uh, in the system. We started looking at that problem more holistically from a cyber physical perspective. So how, how can you improve and the way that you perform intrusion detection or even anomaly detection on a cyber physical system? What's unique about that system that uh, allows you to do a number of things, namely four, which is can I detect something that's maybe abnormal or something malicious 
faster, you know, number one, can I do it faster? Uh, can I do it more more accurately? And can I detect more by doing, by monitoring a physical system in, in new ways? Can I understand what the root cause is by by looking at that holistic system? I think the fourth one was, I'm trying to read off the top of my head now what the fourth one was. We'll come back to it, but there's three, there's three for you. There's a fourth, there's, there's a fourth one there, the fourth one there, but faster, more accurately, uh, and, and the root, and the root cause, at least with the was main, it a, the main Was point. it availability? It was, it wasn't availability, it was more around, I think it was root cause. I'll come back, I'll come back, as I talk about it, I'll, I'll remember. But the, the, main, the main three that I mentioned were the most important ones. So looking holistically at the physical system, how can we detect faster, more accurately, and understand the root cause of what, what, what an anomaly or intrusion is? So when we looked at that problem, we, what, what we identified was, okay, you know, we need to be able to both look at what's happening from a computational perspective or a sub-physical system. Let me take one step back, actually. When we talk about a sub-physical system, what we really mean is any system, whether it's a, uh, an embedded system at the edge, so it could be a program or logic controller, could be a semi-autonomous robotic system, could be an entire factory, right? Food manufacturing, plant, the production lines. A sub-physical system, how you describe that, at, let's say a high level would be that you have some computational component that controls a physical actuation or sensing and such that there is a computational component that is executing some program, maybe it's connected to a network where that computational aspect of that system does have that control. It will create some physical phenomena or receive data from that physical phenomena and perform some function as a result. And so of course that can manifest at the very small level, controller level, program logic mm -hmm. controller, robotic system, or it can be extrapolated to the high level. So multiple different systems that with automation and connectivity uh, between them in a production line. And so when we looked at that cyber physical problem and how attacks can create impact, so if I attack a cyber physical system, I may be able to create or cause a physical impact as a result of that. What was really clear was that when you want to identify intrusions or anomalies in those systems, you should be looking at the system from a cyber physical perspective. And it kind of sounds like common sense, right? Okay, cyber physical system, if I'm going to monitor problems and anomalies and threats, I should monitor it from a cyber physical. And what that meant was, it's not only looking at network traffic or taking data from the, you know, the computational aspects, you know, log data from CPU and the program processes, etc. if they're even available in the first place, of course, but also taking all the physical telemetry you know, temperature, vibration, speed, and the pressure. current, and pressure, amperage. Like, you know, imagine all the physical properties and metrics you can, mm -hmm. and understanding that they could be important from the monitoring point of view. And so what we did was lots of experimentation. We were focusing on actually a, a, a robotic system in a in a, an operational scenario at the time. And we moved on to smart homes later, which I perhaps we might talk about at some point. Mm -hmm. We collected the physical data as well as the cyber data. I'm just going to branch into cyber, right? I'm not going to talk about the specifics. We took physical data, we took the cyber data, and obviously that's very complex. And writing rules around detection in that space is quite complicated, right? So that's why we brought in AI. How can we leverage AI to fuse that data together in a meaningful way that allows us to do detection across large amounts of data at high speed and see if that proves the way that we can detect. So we detect more, i.e. we can detect physical anomalies, we can detect cyber anomalies, and by the way, now I'm a fourth one. So it's detecting more. Can we detect it more accurately? Okay, can I detect more more accurately because of that? Can I detect it faster? And can I know the root cause? And what we realized is that, you know, again, it's all somewhat common sense, Christine, but the first signs of something going wrong are phys can be physical indicators. So physical indicators of a normal, of normal behavior can be the first signs of a cyber-related incident or not as the case may be. So firstly, we identified that if you're measuring physical, you can identify things faster because that might emerge in the physical properties faster than it will in the network, for example, or the computational state. And then we realized that we can detect more. So we can detect, for example, physical anomalies at the same time as detecting cyber anomalies or threats using AI in this data. And then we realized actually we can make it more, we can detect more accurately because we can see, okay, when we detect these anomalies by including the physical data in the process, we can actually detect more accurately the anomaly than otherwise. Because we can say, okay, the combination of the cyber data, network process, what have you, physical data, temperature, pressure, et cetera, actually allows us to filter out more false positives of noise that just occurs in both those types of um, data types. And then finally, do we know what the root cause was? Is it cyber related or not? And of course, by having that full review, we could really discriminate whether an anomaly or threat behavior in the machine was cyber related or not. And so that scientific research, let's say, was really early for the market, right? Because the market hadn't even started and even looking yeah. in terms of like deploying intrusion detection. You know, we hadn't even thought about network monitoring in OT to a large extent but 10 years ago. From a practitioner level, those of us who were in the field doing that work, that that is what we were trying to do. Yeah. We had so too much data. We didn't have that AI component yet to yeah. do all that work because to do all that work would have meant pulling over 
logs and bread sheets and <laughs> yeah. nobody likes doing that. When you're supposed to be putting out fire somewhere else in the building or making sure there isn't a fire, for example. So the fact that we, this is why I tell people, don't be afraid of AI. Yeah. It is a yeah. tool to help you do your job better. And if you don't embrace it early, especially in the food industry, is very embraceable of it. I mean, yeah. they automate everything. It's, they can automate it. They're happy because automation of processes in the food industry keeps food safer because mm-hmm. humans aren't touching it. As I continue to say this on every episode, <laughs> humans are a risk. <laughs> they are the biggest risk. I think the biggest problem though there is, or at least the thing that we don't, like from the scientific space, when you're doing the research, you don't have, you don't consider the challenge of how do I get the data? Because you've got the data, right? So you're focusing on the, the sharpier end of the problem from a scientific perspective. You know, back in 2014, we're like, okay, we've got the data because we, we, we got it, right? We didn't think about the practicality of getting the data. We weren't working in a plant where you've got an Excel spreadsheet or paper spread, you know, a paper clipboard taking readings of a HMI. So in this case, the data acquisition wasn't even considered, which I believe is one of the biggest challenges, data acquisition. So we just found, you know, this is a really great approach using AI to facilitate this kind of detection capability. Of course, there was another outcome from that, which is, okay, the explainability piece. How do you actually make that information useful to the engineer? If I'm just going to produce an output that is, Anomaly, no anomaly, right? That yeah. is useful as a chocolate teapot, you know, if we're honest, right? It, <laughs> and it is, right? Because because obviously an engineer's like, okay, that's what am I gonna do with that information? You know, if anything's gonna make them annoyed, or you know, if it's a security team or even the operator, process automation engineer, they need something that's gonna provide clear aspect of behavior and and give indication of where that's happening, why it's you know, what's happening where. Uh, and so they can go and inspect and, and respond. Yeah, basically they just want to know, do I need to care or not care right now? Because it's yeah. something I need to deal with at this moment or can it wait? Just That's less. what they want to know. And yeah. if you could give them that certainty of shifting data through the research, like that's huge for them. Yeah. So I would, I would speed ahead on that, but basically that was what we, the, st- the, the stage we got to. I mean, and then, I mean, I, I moved on for that research uh, a couple of years after that. We did, we moved to Smart Home. Basically we extended it to Smart Home to some extent covers the, the entire blanket of production systems in a way, because the Smart Home we were looking at then was, you've got everything, you've got actuation, you've got sensors. Of course, it's not the safety related aspects that you'd see in a, in a, in a factory, in a, in a, in a food manufacturing plant, for example, but it was just the complexity of the problem, which is I've got all these different systems doing loads of stuff and automation. Can we move it to there and see the same problem? And, and there we, we basically extended the, the, the premise and, and again, proved it further, its efficacy, its fidelity. But, but the same problem remained, which is how do you make this practical? And so the research proved the, the hypotheses, right? It proved the value of it. The next stage really was okay, who's going to commercialize this and bring it into a product capability to bring it to the market so that it can be used in the real world? Obviously, we'll have a discussion about what excellence do later. That's not what we do, but that's where we stopped and we can approve the premise, the value of it. So it's an AI-driven cyber-physical intrusion detection. Okay, listeners, let's take a quick detour and go back to class for a moment. We know Ryan can get a bit technical, but fear not. Here's a bite-sized glossary to keep you in the loop. First on our list is PLC, Programmable Logic Controller. Think of it like the brain of R2-D2 or BB-8 from Star Wars, controlling their movements and actions, but for industrial machines. It's the genius behind the scenes, making sure your coffee brews perfectly every morning. Now let's get to SCADA. It stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Picture Tony Stark monitoring Stark Industries operations from his Iron Man suit. SCADA systems provide a bird's eye view of industrial processes similar to how you would use a smart home app to control your lights and thermostats from your phone. Continuing with the Iron Man suit for ICS or industrial control systems, it's not just a piece of armor. It's a complex system where every sensor, actuator, and piece of software works in perfect sync to fly, navigate, and battle. ICS in the industrial world are like the components of the Iron Man suit, working together to ensure everything from power plants to water treatment facilities operates smoothly and efficiently. Just as Tony Stark relies on his suit systems to respond instantly to threats, industries rely on ICS for seamless operations and to respond to any challenges that arise. Lastly, we have OT or operational technology. This is essentially the technology that controls and monitors physical devices. Think of a smart thermostat for your home. OT is similar, but on a much larger scale. For example, the systems that control the temperature and humidity in a large grocery store to keep fruits and vegetables fresh. OT ensures the physical aspects of our world operate smoothly from manufacturing plants to heating and cooling buildings. Thanks for coming to class. Now back to the episode. You know, I, I talk a lot with the 
the food protection folks, obviously. And we keep talking about how we probably have data that could help each other. Yeah. So there's a big traceability thing that's happening right now within the food industry. I, you know, really want to be able to trace down the food all the way down to like the plant to be able to determine if there's any type of illness that came from that particular field or whatever. Mm. I think that the tools that we use in cybersecurity can definitely be leveraged to help understand the cyber physical aspects of when a contamination might have happened in a facility. We can't exactly do it in the field yet. I mean, I'm sure yeah. we're going to get there eventually. I would love to see cybersecurity for a farm field. Like that would be really cool because everything, be everything's going automated, right? I mean, there's yeah. autonomous tractors that are running. You've got drones that are autonomous running around checking for things. You have fire suppression. It's just a smart home. It's just a smart feel, right? Yeah, exactly. So ultimately there's that is to design as well. So, but like I said, we've, we talked about how we need to share more data because we're doing the same assessments basically, but just in a different angle. One's looking at it from a quality, one's looking at it from a food defense, one's looking at it from cybersecurity. But there's like all this data that needs to be pulled together to have a full and complete food safety culture. Yeah. Like that needs to happen. And I think, I think using AI is going to be the way we eventually get there. And I obviously, this is all infancy kind of conversations where nobody's really doing this yet, but there needs to be more of a click in somewhere where that data is shared, whether it's a sock monitoring or yeah, exactly. something I mean, like that. One of the things that we've, we've realized, at least at X and um, but also from talking to the industry, is that, you know, we don't have to talk about attacks all the time, right? Cyber attacks. Okay. We talk about cybersecurity from a, again, a more holistic point of view, which is, you know, when something goes wrong, at any point in the supply chain, but let's just focus on the production line for a moment. Mm -hmm. When to make control, do we know if it was a, whether it's a physical fault, like an electrical or mechanical failure or some other component in the process that was causing that issue? Or is it cyber related? And just knowing if, if something is cyber related or not is a very important first step in understanding how to respond appropriately. When we say yeah. cyber related, we don't necessarily mean, you know, that there's a bad guy or via the internet attacking you. It could be simply that one of the systems that are responsible for helping coordinate the automation in the process has failed or or, you know, the network has, has changed and caused a disruption or there's a misconfiguration. And, you know, that's really still cybersecurity from an availability and integrity point of view. Not confidentiality, mm -hmm. of course, but certainly it's cybersecurity because the computational system that's responsible for helps executing that process, you know, let's say moving the conveyor belt with the Twixes, for example, and then dripping the chocolate over them has has failed for some reason and so surely the process automation engineers or the, the supervisory uh, team looking at a process scholar terminals would want to know oh by the way your process has been disrupted but it wasn't the fact the motor broke on the conveyor belt it was because someone just happened to fat finger a button you know or, uh -huh. or misconfiguration or whatever that might be and so for them you ask them do you care they're like yeah I, obviously i care about that right i want to know but if you say okay do you care about cyber security attacks i think there's a disconnect in some of the cultural thinking of these people because that's not what they're worried about they say they're worried about downtime or disruption to the process so if you can actually say cyber physical helps in franchise their monitoring then the data sharing becomes easier because they want that data for themselves but it's equally useful for them and the it team exactly and i think and you just really nailed you nailed it right here. There's so much disinformation and misinformation, specifically mm. in the food industry, but in, even within cybersecurity, we don't even know what people do half the time. It's yeah. It's very confusing. So I read a blog recently from a food professional, food safety professional, and the comment was made that a cyber attack isn't something to worry about in the food industry because it has to be cyber as physically assisted. And I'm like, it's still a cyber attack, no matter what happens. <laughs> Whether someone got the, the password or flipped a switch on the physical side and allowed the cyber attack to come in, it's still a cyber attack and it's still worrying regardless. Because yeah. insider threat is huge. People don't realize that. Because yeah. we innately want to believe that we're all going to do the right thing and that we're all going to, you know, be good people because that's what we were trained to do. Yeah. And ultimately, this social engineering has become really difficult to deal with because it's basically like having to think like a villain when you're thinking <laughs> about it. And, and this is why I say to people, nothing surprises me anymore. It's very few things that surprise me in the, in the security world anymore, unless it's just blatantly a dumb behavior. I suppose that would sort of go, wait, why? But how does your technology help with social engineering? So say, like you said, somebody fat fingered something. I Would think, the detection um, help that? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, so one of the things is ultimately, you know, you could have, let's say you're a, you're a I've actually got this anecdote from speaking to a manufacturer where you might be acquiring other manufacturers, particularly in the food industry, maybe you're acquiring another food company that has a product you want to buy, right? So you acquire that company and you inherit 
have, you know, the, all their operations and all their staff and all the way they do different things differently to you. So you might, let's say you have a really sweet security operation, cybersecurity, monitoring, safety, etc. And you inherit that organization. Obviously, there's a transition period. There might be, I'm going to use the word Bob, and I pick on Bob, this make-believe, longer tooth dinosaur, who has mm-hmm. worked in that factory for 20 years, who just decides to manually change some parameters on the process, right? Maybe it's for a HMI human machine interface that plugs into changing maybe the recipe uh, on a production line, whatever that might be. But they do that because that's what they've always done, right? And maybe that's mm-hmm. completely contrary to the change management process that the organization who acquired them has. Now, it doesn't have to be an acquisition process, but this is a real life example. Some no, I, you act, you're speaking truth. I've heard these, I've experienced and heard these, so. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's a real world problem people are seeing. And so when you think about that, the organization wants to know, okay, well, I want to know when Bob's doing that because that can create a problem, right? Particularly if like that it's, it's affecting the process in some way, whether it breaks anything or not, I want to know about that behavior. So that that's kind of indirect inside the threat in a way because the person's not aiming to do damage, maybe intentionally, but at the same time, you know, you want to be able to identify that behavior. Absolutely. I think that sub-physical monitoring and using AI to, 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 to do the data analysis at scale and bring out those aspects is, is going to support that. For instance, pretty maintenance won't, won't identify that. That's just going to be identifying posts in the production line that might break in three months' time. So you replace mm-hmm. it quickly. Conditional monitoring, traditional conditional monitoring, isn't designed to detect that because that's designed to say, okay, tell me when there's a dangerous value going to be able to refresh holding the temperature so that I can, I don't know, enact the safety instrumentation system or you know, take some physical response to that process. But those behaviors happening between are going to go under the radar unless you're actively monitoring how the, the computational systems on the cyber side and the physical process is changing, maybe even subtly. And so you can spot that and identify those cases and report them. Or, you know, and maybe it's not a person, maybe it's, you know, it could be just someone deployed a new recipe and it just didn't work as, as well as they thought in the real world as it did on the test bed. You can spot those behaviors as well. And I think that's what's really important here is that cyber physical monitoring with the AI can spot those subtle cases with complex relationships between the, the system and the process, they can spot the, the, those behaviors and tell you without you having to, I don't know, sit there and write all those cases down by yourself and spend six months to a year trying to do that and never getting an outcome. But for sure, that was that, that Bob case was one they can't, this organization could not identify it and they need the monitoring for. And the only way they can do that is by taking that holistic view. Yeah. And I think it's also a holistic view to your staff as well, your employees. I've met Bobs that have purposely withheld information to keep their jobs because yeah. um, they, they, it makes them important or at least in their mind important. And they've missed the opportunity of learning new things to become even more important, if you will. And that that's really frustrating. I think in this day and age, you can't just be a one trick pony. I really do think you have to be a jack of all trades and a lot of areas inside yeah. of production and, and basically within manufacturing and food production in a way. Not everybody wears one hat. You wear like 15. And I think that education piece alongside of the detection is so important. Not necessarily education on the detection software because not everybody needs to know that that's there. Yeah. Just the, the people who need to know kind of thing. But having people understand that You can't make changes in isolation. That whole change management process, this just feeds into that more because now you're going to actually have to sit down and look at people process with this detection and that ability to be able to see what's going on or what isn't going on, I suppose, as well. That's that's huge because now you can actually create a holistic cybersecurity plan, whereas before you had to kind of like wing it, like based on like tribal knowledge and what was happening, which I'm not saying is a bad thing either, because if you've been there entrenched long enough, you would know. But I think people, we need the additional help. How can we actually start putting in parameters to correct behavior and fix things moving forward and even thinking about offense if we can't even deal with what we've got in front of us? So that's that's great. I love that. I wish I had this like a job like five years ago, to be honest, what you're talking about. Anzen Sage proudly introduces Anzen OT, our innovative AI powered software as a service designed to simplify operational technology risk management. Anzen OT streamlines how organizations assess and manage cybersecurity risks in their OT environments by leveraging AI insights. Anzen OT empowers businesses to conduct comprehensive risk assessments efficiently and ensuring compliance and security without costly third-party evaluations. Ready to transform your OT risk management approach? For more details and to join our beta waitlist, visit anzenot.com. That's A-N-Z-E-N-O-T.com. Anzen OT. 
simplifying risk management, where empathy meets innovation. But anyways, let's let's talk a little bit about your product, Ryan, yeah. how you became a co-founder. You could talk about your other co-founders if you want. I sure. love to hear about, you, you know, the birth of the organization, how long you've been a lo- around. And then I really want you to, to relate it back to how is this product, what makes it special and why the food industry would even want to bring it in, especially since they're already digitizing at a very fast rate. Yeah. Budgets are tight. Like how do, why, why? Just, I want to know. No, advice. absolutely. So, so Excellence have existed for a little while, but not in its current, let's say, manifestation. The company started off as an R&D company uh, in 2015, actually, and it will come as no surprise that it was working in cyber physical systems AI, the intrusion detection. This is shocking. But, this is yeah, shocking yeah, yeah. information. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but I wasn't working at the company at the time. It was one of my, my colleagues uh, who, who co-founded the R&D organization and uh, who, had wor- who had worked in the past with me on some of that research I mentioned. In, any, in essence, the R&D company was doing lots of prototyping work with European, so it's a UK and European company, um, was working in European projects and, and, and doing this across emerging sectors. So we're to talk about manufacturing and food, but also like maritime right smart group because we're seeing it across the board this this digital transformation and then three years ago which doesn't feel like three years ago at all uh, feels like yesterday I was invited to to basically to to help take over the company and spin out an actual product uh, from the company because obviously I've been involved in in the past and all that work uh, and brought together that that industry experience so I was I was looking for opportunities to create a startup but then this was now the vehicle to do so so I joined as a co-founder with one of my other co-founders who's CTO called Sadeande Ramados, who's a really incredible software program engineer and architect. And what we did is we we basically walked together where we was as a, as a company and we said, look, these are the we're seeing the, the the value proposition here of building a cyber physical monitoring technology. But now we need to build a product out of that. We need to bring what we've learned both in the R and D space from this company, see backgrounds that we had. He was working in automotive actually beforehand. You know, three years ago, we then decided, okay, good, we've got, we've got some bootstrapping. We're going to build this side of physical launch technology. And we spent a long time, right, three years, maybe two and a half, because it's been out about half a year now. That long time really building this technology, getting the feedback from the industry, solving a really difficult problem, if I'm honest, of how do you utilize AI, get the data you need, the physical data from the production lines, the cyber data from the networks and, the, and these, these industrial endpoints. And I want to all those questions I mentioned before, right, which is when something's going wrong, what's the root cause? Is it cyber related or not? Okay, fine. Can we answer that one? We can use AI to answer that. Can we detect faster? Can we automatically establish how we should monitor temperature, how we should monitor the network without requiring a data scientist in a, in a, in a food manufacturing environment, right? Because what we saw was that the big organizations in the market, I won't name names, but they'll, they're bringing data scientists, right? They're spending millions on their own custom way of trying to get this data from, uh, and I talk about food manufacturing companies as well, here, get this data from their production lines, from the shop floor, and then somehow you know do, do this this monitoring and identify problems and forecast them and be more optimal in their process and prevent downtime. Well, that's a lot of money, right? That's millions of pounds. These are the apex predators in the industry. They can afford to do that. And they bring on data scientists that spend a year doing it. Well, no, you shouldn't have to do that, right? You should be able to have your own cyber physical AI analyst, right? This is our thesis. So, and your cyber physical AI analyst that can collect that data from existing systems without any changes to them that can understand this is normal in the physical, this is normal in cyber, and this is normal between both. And then tell you, this is what's going on, this is the root cause, this is how you respond. I mean, I had a background in AI and people in the company had that as well. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And that's what we really built. We built a technology that effectively, we call it cyber physical AI, which is again, a fancy term and sounds very markety. But the idea is that we are able to plug into your existing systems in your industrial networks, your OT networks, collect data from your industrial endpoints, so your program or logic controllers, your remote terminal units, actuators and sensors, but exactly the same way you're already collecting it for SCADA. So if you're doing some notional monitoring, Okay, good. We're just going to upcycle that data already. You know, we just can connect those systems exactly the same way, but use that data for something more than you're already using it for. And we're going to collect the data from the network that you may or may not be collecting already. And then from that, have the system identify known threat behaviors, but also the stuff that's anonymous, right? The thing that's unknown. And by doing that, we realize, okay, cool. We've got this level of capability in the, in the technology, which is good. It's great, right? But then again, it might not be available for those more medium-sized you know, food manufacturers where they haven't yep. got a massive SOC. So how do we help them? And what we realize is we could build a layer on top, which kind of acts like an analyst, an AI analyst in a way that says, I can take this anomaly from the physical, but I can take this anomaly from the, the network and cyber. And I can determine how this, this set of behavior and what it means, much like a human would. 
were you doing your, yep. your, your normal analysis? And so we did that and we and we able to we built a technology that, that basically allows you to say, okay, if something normal is happening in physical or not, something normal is happening in cyber or not, my network, for example, and it's a it's a, a process malfunction. This is a root cause. It's not a cybersecurity threat. So you know, seeing nothing to no evidence to suggest that. Uh, and here's the way it's happening, and this is what's happening. It's the process is happening on. It's how you can respond. But conversely, the analyst can say, okay, it's a cybersecurity threat, and you know, this is why it's a cybersecurity threat. And what we realised is with that technology we built, like I said, to a long time, this was also equally useful for the engineers on the shop floor as it is for the existing or newer emerging. IT slash OT security analyst socks, whereby the engineers who would, you know, we talk to a lot of them directly, they don't even talk about cybersecurity's case, is integrating that monitoring visibility in their environment allows them to spot things they can never spot before. Like I said yep. to you before, Christine, is it cyber related or not? You know, it is is an abnormal activity which is not breaching any condition monitoring thresholds or it's not a predictive maintenance problem or we could set that as well. Is, is this an anomaly? Do I care about it? Like you said, I think you said before we discussed this, do I care about this now or should I look at it later? And yeah. that was some really big breakthrough for us, which is We've got a technology that provides holistic benefit. And we found this was the way of breaking down barriers to get better monitoring for everyone, in the, particularly in food manufacturing, where you mentioned, why is it relevant? Because it's running at speed, produces high amounts of output for the most part across the industry. And when something goes down, you know, that's a, a significant impact on the business, but also on the supply chain. You know, things don't turn up in the supermarket, right? There's a really good story where a manufacturer logistic company called Back Logistics in Netherlands, the company got uh, compromised by ransomware and um, go figure, right? what happens everywhere. I was going to say current theme, <laughs> unfortunately. But they shut things down out of the abundance of caution because they didn't know what was affected. They couldn't answer the question, has this affected the process or not? Has this affected, you know, what, what was the root cause? And what happened then was, you know, <laughs> funny enough, that, so they do cheese, right? There's a cheese uh, uh, manufacturer. The supermarket shelves were empty of cheese. But it was a really like, I mean, people were like, oh no, no cheese, no, the world's going to end. Well, the point is, is like you just extrapolate that to important foods, right? You know, the, the, the staple foods that everyone needs. It could, be, it could be rice, for example, right? It could be breads. It could be really, you know, could water. be baby formula. Baby, for, exactly, right? Yeah. Is, that is a nightmare for people that can't actually feed, you know, naturally or whatever, whatever reason, right? Yeah. So that that's super important, and and so therefore spotting issues very fast and knowing how to respond appropriately is super important in food manufacturing and, and yeah. that fast moving consumer goods super you all know this much better than I will but it, you know, it's super important so when we are speaking to organisations we are asking the question when it goes wrong do you know if it's cyber related or not they say no or it can take days or weeks to find out after the investigative process and the th- thing is, you know, you speak to some manufacturers and they'll be like, well, uh, we don't see the issue, right? Because we're air gapped and we've got no concerns and that's a whole lot of discussion. Oh, too. God. <laughs> I can't talk fun. about air gap. But what we found, you know, what we, we, we kind of played back to them when we, we were, were showcasing technology is, well, you know, can, they, they don't even think about cyber attacks right now. Just think about if something went wrong and you couldn't find the answer if it's cyber related or not because you don't have some physical visibility in your monitoring detection. What do you do? And they kind of come and start, but is an element of not trying to put people's noses out of joint, right? Because it's like, oh, well, we, we, we're perfect, we're fine. And the short answer is, well, at some point, you're going to want to digitally transform, connect and automate more because you need, if you've got a fast moving consumer goods process, that's going to need to be optimized. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't produce, you know, I think you mentioned this before to me, Christine, maybe it was before we started the call, where quality, right? You've got quality. That is a, that's a measurement, a supporting measurement. How much of this batch of food is bad for whatever reason or good is you've got output how much am i producing based on the on the supply chain demand when am i going to have to change things in my process and what am i going to introduce in terms of downtime so these are things that they should care about regardless of cybersecurity attack vectors or threat actors right it's kind of their day-to-day business and so as they connect and automate more naturally they're going to want some physical visibility and, and, and analysis and so that unpicked that that barrier, Christine of Horus, is that with our technology, what we built, sorry, I'm giving you a real answer to a question, is what we built is, an, is, a, is a solution that allows to both serve the needs of the people on the shop floor, process automation engineers, the engineers in the factory, as well as providing the same telemetry for security teams that desperately need it to understand when it's actually a real security threat to be considered. And and that's where I think is a breakthrough for the industry, actually. I think that food manufacturers in particular should be going, okay, I can see how this can help me now. And perhaps when I even care a bit more about cybersecurity. Yeah. And it goes back to that traceability role. You'll be able to actually see the timeline of if there is an issue or food defense teams will be able to come up with a plan of attack or a plan of defense, if you will, a little bit better if they can see the data. How many times I've talked to food to talk to food defense and they said, we just don't know what we don't know because we don't have it, you know? And of course that's very much a security vibe as well. And I've said this before on the podcast and I will probably continue to say it. These mid-sized companies and these smaller companies, 
won't actually be able to to produce at the volume and that they're going to be requested to at some point. These smaller houses are getting bigger because people want more of that experience. That boutique experience is really popular. They're going to have to use AI. Otherwise, they're going to have a huge labor force, which they won't be able to afford. I was also thinking too, Ryan, while you were talking that IoT type refrigerators are becoming really popular. So like that grab and go sandwich in the airport or I don't know, a college campus or a a train station, anything like that. Food in general is going IoT. Wouldn't you want to know if one of those sensors failed or if it was under temperature? Because you wouldn't want people buying the sandwich if it was underneath, you know, specs to be eaten. That's really messed up. And then you've got a whole PR issue because you're killing people with your, (laughs) you know, gross sandwich. I think that that type of like, software will be embraced more by those type of companies because that's just one headache gone but again it goes back to that ability to be able to trace it and that's going to be huge yeah so i think this is this is really good to hear like the the people are actually starting to come up with these ideas and put them into practice and it's getting good practical traction like Mm. good for you like it's nice to hear that it's not just like another security tool, the blah, 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 or or all those buzzy words and or marketing to all fill. <laughs> I applaud like th- those techniques because I think you were also a Black Hat this year, which yeah. is a security conference. Um, you were at DEF CON, but yeah, so saw Black Hat. And it's a security conference. We call it Hacker Summer Camp for those who are in the security industry. It's just this gathering of all of us, basically. And it's a lot of like flash and, and pomp and circumstance <laughs> in a lot of ways. And a lot of these vendors that come through there's just it's don't get me wrong i appreciate the swag i appreciate like the <laughs> the candor but you're like wow you're either going to be bought or you're going to fizzle out in a year i won't know yeah. you you know yeah yeah uh, and i think that you've got longevity because you're attaching to critical infrastructure in a way that we need we haven't had yeah. that yet i mean i know there's other tools out there i'm not beating up on anybody and i have my own opinions of that anyways but this definitely seems like something especially for the food industry can be utilized in different aspects, both on the quality front, the protection front, and anything to go within supply chain, you'll actually be able to start seeing things rather than, I suppose it happened on an idle Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon, rather than like, now you're gonna have actual data that's gonna show when this all went down. I think that's amazing. So thank you, Ryan, for sharing that and for uh, the work you're doing team. I'm excited to see where you're gonna take this because I'm sure there's plenty of expansion ideas. On a final note, before we go, I want to make sure you give um, everybody the information they need to find you. In terms of like, where you can find us, um, so xlens.com is our, is our website. Uh, we're, we're quite active on, on LinkedIn under xlens. We post a lot and not just about what we do as a product, but we have, you know, we try to share as much content to nurture the industry as possible. The last thing is we do have a community edition for our tool. So, you know, what we don't want to do is, I don't don't pick on lower vendors, but, you know, sometimes it's really hard to get access to these technologies and to see what they can do and how they can benefit you. Excellence Community Edition is free for anyone, small, medium, large. You can download it. You can can try it out and see how it can help with that visibility picture just to start with. So people are interested in getting their hands on, just come to our website. And they can also find you on uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, find me on LinkedIn and I'm more than happy to talk about food manufacturing, cybersecurity. And just and of course, thank you very much Christine, for inviting me to have a conversation on here with you as well. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm really selective about what vendors I allow on this podcast. And generally speaking, I'm very careful because I want my podcast to be a benefit to people. I want people to gain knowledge. And Ryan, you just shared a whole like buttload of knowledge. Like that was a lot. I mean, I'm sitting here going, yep, yep, I'm resonating. <laughs> you can't see me, but I'm shaking my head and definitely was, uh, it's just, it's so good that we're finally getting here yeah, that OT indeed. and ICS and SCADA and all that are starting to get their due. I know so many people that are in the process side, engineers that yeah. have just been begging for things like this for a very long time because they can't do their job in isolation. And yeah, that's and you exactly don't want, why. The thing is as well, like they, don't, they don't want to be sold a, jo- uh, a need for cybersecurity. They don't think they have a role in. If you can give them a, a technology that helps them with their day job, but it'll extend it to the extra digitization they're experiencing, you know, that's the hearts and minds. That kind of breaks down the cultural barriers. And I think that's the key here is that any technology adoption, whatever it might be, needs to benefit people. They need to feel like they benefit from it. Otherwise, it's someone else's job, someone else's problem. And I think that's the one thing to get. And hopefully we can be, play a small part in that, in, in solving that problem. Yeah, and I think you're going to. So uh, congratulations on that. We're, I'm looking forward to watching you grow. And thank you very much for your time again, Ryan. Thanks so much, Christine. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers. And that wraps up 
another enlightening Bites and Bites podcast episode. A huge thank you to Dr. Ryan Hartfield for joining us today and sharing his invaluable expertise on the critical role of AI and cybersecurity in the food industry. It's clear that as our world becomes more connected, the need of innovation and these types of solutions has never been more important, especially when it comes to keeping the food supply chain safe and secure. To all of you, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As a parting thought, all of Ryan's info and the community demo he mentioned will be in the show notes. I'm Kristen Demeranville, and it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us. Stay safe, stay curious, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now.